when we um, when we talk about adaptations, one of the easiest ones to understand is camouflage. If we look around the natural world, we see lots of organisms that are camouflaged, that blend in with their environment. Okay. And this camouflage is helpful in a couple ways. If you're preyed upon by other animals, often camouflage is a way to hide from the predators that are looking to eat you. Or if you're a predator, camouflage is a way to sort of sneak up and be hidden until you can catch your prey. And it makes sense how camouflage evolves over time. Just like we all have different hair colors, eye colors, skin colors, there's a variation among us. In the natural world, there's variation among the color of fur and squirrels, or the pattern of coloration, or in trees, okay, or in plants, or in insects. There's variation. And so if one certain variation happens to make that organism more hidden where it lives, that's going to be beneficial. It's probably going to survive better, reproduce, pass on that trait to its offspring. And so again, generation after generation, the species starts to become more and more camouflaged. We'll watch a video maybe next week that's a really good example about um, these mice that scientists observed. And after their habitat became darker, scientists can record and look at how these mice changed over time due to natural stuff. So let's just look at some examples because they're kind of neat to look at. So this is a flounder. That's a fish. Okay. This is the fish. This is its at the bottom of its habitat. It blends in almost perfectly. It's almost impossible to see. Again, that's a great adaptation. Okay. Here you have an owl. Its adaptation allows it to blend in with the background of a tree so it can be hidden until it's time for it to find prey. Nimix is um, a deer-like creature. These live in the, the Middle East, dry, rocky terrain. And their coloration allows them to blend in extremely well with sort of this background. Here's one that's easy to see. You can see it here, it's antlers. But here's another one, a small baby one. You can see that. Here's another one crawling across the rocks. Can you see it? It looks like a rock, but those are three uh, ibexes. We're going to talk about these. I have a better picture that I'll explain in a minute. Here are two peppered moths. One is obvious to see, but there's another lighter colored moth right next to it that you can't see very well. Same thing, here's a lighter colored pepper moth, the dark one that blends in very well with the background of this tree. This is a catadid, it's an insect. This is its body, this is not a leaf. This is its exoskeleton. It looks like a leaf, it looks like a leaf walking around. It's evolved through natural selection to look like that leaf, to avoid predators very hard to see it. Even like a household cat has pretty good camouflage depending on condition. See the cat? People always say, oh yeah, I see it, but who thinks, who sees it? Jordan, tell me, up, down, right, left. Okay, so up, uh, <coughs> no, down, left, Who really thinks they see a cat? <coughs> Brandon? Uh, right. Up a little bit. And then a little bit to the left. Yeah. Nope. Oh. What? There. Oh. Wait, where? Where? Oh, wow. That's awesome. See, it's outlined in red. Oh, you can't even see it. Yeah. 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 You can see it. Where is it? 
its legs. Oh. There's its arm. There's its head. Sorry, hold on. Uh, this one's obvious. You can see the frog, but again, it's because it's a close up. From farther away, it'd be very hard to see this frog on this like, leaf. This is kind of far away, so it's a little bit uh, harder to see. Oh, I see it. What is it? It's a, it's a bear? No, it's a lynx. Yeah. It's a cat. That's a cat. A wild cat. All right, so we are going to be, your lab that we're going to do later today and working on tomorrow is about peppered moths. So let me tell you the story about the peppered moth, because they are an excellent example. This is an excellent example of evolution that scientists were actually able to study carefully. You know, usually when we talk about natural selection evolution, it's something that takes hundreds of thousands, millions of years. So it's hard for scientists to study that um, as it's happening. But there are many examples of natural selection that scientists were able to document. And peppered moss is one of them. This example of evolution in peppered moss that scientists study um, took place in the middle of the 1800s. Okay? Um, in the early part of the 1800s, in England, there were these moths called peppered moths. And they had a wide variety of colors, of coloration. Gray, white, dark. But in the early 1800s, the vast majority of peppered moths that were recorded were light-colored peppered moths. Sometimes there would be some dark ones, but not very often. So here you see the dark peppered moth. Here is the light peppered moth. And what you see here, this background of the tree, these peppered moths rest on trees for most of the time. And in the early 1800s, in this area of England, most of the trees were covered in lichen, that white scaly stuff I'm sure you've seen before. And so in this situation, the light colored peppered moth blends in very well. The dark peppered moth does not. So what typically would happen with the darker moths? Mia? They'd be more likely to be eaten by predators. Birds eat peppered moths. And so they weren't very common. Lighter colored moths were more common because they survive better and therefore can reproduce. What are their offspring like? Light in color. Now, something happened in England in the middle of the 1800s something you learned about in social studies probably last year. There's a major change called the Industrial Revolution. Who could tell me what that means? The Industrial <coughs> Revolution. Did you learn? You probably didn't learn about this year yet, right? Brandon, what is it? Yeah, more technology, more advanced factories started to be um, made, and goods were starting to be mass produced. But the Industrial Revolution required energy, and the source of that energy, for the most part, was coal. And when you burn coal, you know what? You use energy, but you know what the result is, John? Lots of smog. Lots of smog, lots of pollution, lots of smoke. And what happened in this area of England, as they started to use more and more coal in these factories, the bark of the trees started becoming darker. Soot, smoke built up on the bark of the trees. The lichens died off due to pollution. And so the overall color of the trees around these industrial areas turned much darker. Can you guess? What happened after that? Claudia? The darker colored moths became more popular. Yeah, why would they become more popular? You're right. What happened? Brianna? Because the predators would start seeing the lightly colored ones better and eating them and not the dark colored ones. So, what could the darker ones do better? Camouflage. They could then. <laughs> survive and reproduce, and when they had offspring, what were they like? Darker moths. The lighter colored moths then were now at a disadvantage. 
they were more likely to be eaten, less likely to reproduce. And over time, they became less and less common. And scientists could document this, because they could go out in the forest and record how many moths were they seeing year after year, and they saw this change. Now, the important thing to keep in mind, because we've, we've mentioned this before, could this moth change its coloration during its lifetime to this moth? No. no. This moth is always going to be dark. It can't change its pattern just because it would be helpful. That's not the way it works. It has certain genes that give it dark pigment, and that's what it's going to be. Okay? So it's not that individual. So did moth, individual moths adapt to this new condition? No. But the species did. Over a period of time, the species became better adapted to being in this condition. That's how evolution works. Okay? Evolution works on groups, not individuals. We'll talk more about the activity in a little bit. The last thing to talk about is something really interesting is called mimicry. Does anyone know what mimicry is? Oops. Yes, when one species, let's not quite say organism, right, because it makes it sound like I'm changing to look like a tree or something. When one species has evolved to look like another species. Okay? That's mimicry. When one species evolves to look like another species. <clears throat> and often, this is a helpful adaptation. Do you know why, Jenna? Because other animals won't want to eat it if it looks like this kind of Yeah, so sometimes plants, animals, evolve to look like a poisonous species. Because most predators have learned through evolution not to eat poisonous animals, not to go near them, to be scared of them. And so often a species will mimic or look like a dangerous or poisonous um, other species to avoid predators. Other times they might mimic a species to try to attract prey to them. Those are two of the main reasons why species evolve mimicry. And there's some neat examples I'll show you of species that mimic other species. Anybody know what type of snake this is? It's a famous one. Jordan? What's that? Not sure? No, I think I know It's a coral snake. Does anybody know anything about coral snakes? They are extremely venomous. They're poisonous. A bite from a coral snake could kill a person. And so most predators have learned to avoid coral snakes, not to go near them. Question, Robert? Um, how much venom can a coral snake like, inject into I'm not sure how much it can inject, but enough to be deadly. That's what I mean. One bite and you can die instantly from a coral snake? Not instantly, but you can die. This is not a coral snake. Okay? That's a scarlet king snake. It looks very similar. However, it is not at all poisonous. It has no venom. It's not threatening at all. But over time, it has evolved to mimic the coral snake. Again, it's so that because predators have learned to avoid the coral snake, they also avoid the scarlet king snake, even though it has no actual venom. Just like you would probably avoid, if you knew what a coral snake looks like, you're probably not going to go near this snake. They're actually not the same coloration. You know, this, there's a saying people use to know the difference. I don't even know the saying. Yeah. It's like black times red, white. Something close to that. The one I've heard, and there's a few different versions. Red next to yellow, you're a dead fellow. Red next to black, you're okay, Jack. You notice the pattern is actually not the same. In the coral snake, red is next to yellow. In the king snake, red is next to black. Yeah, it's just a picture. 
You probably have seen lots of these lately, right? Yeah. What type of butterfly is that? Monarch. Monarch. Monarch butterflies eat um, milkweed. You know what milkweed is? It has those pods and you break it open, it's got that latex in it. Well, monarchs eat that and that latex is actually uh, has some poison in it. It doesn't affect the monarch, it can eat that, but it integrates that poison into its cells and it becomes poisonous. So generally predators avoid monarchs. Birds don't eat monarchs. This is not a monarch butterfly. That is a viceroy butterfly. It has evolved to mimic monarchs to avoid predators. Yeah, there's difference in size as well. They are, um, their populations have certainly declined recently, yes. Um, you know when you said like the, the things that monarch, monarch, monarch butterflies can eat, will they um, like get poisoned by that? No, they only, it doesn't hurt them, but it goes like into their bodies and other animals that might eat the monarchs. This is an orchid, it's called the bee orchid. It's evolved so that it's petals. Now we're talking plants, it's not just animals. It's evolved so that it's, these petals look kind of like a bee and attract bees to it, because bees think it's another bee and they try to mate with it, even though it's not a bee. And in the process, that helps pollinate the orchid. Okay. These are some examples. These are not snakes. These are caterpillars. This is the caterpillar. See it? This is its whole body. But it's evolved so that the shape of this end of it looks like the head of a snake. This is, no, no, it's a fly. A harmless fly. It can't sting, it's called a hoverfly. It has evolved to mimic a bee. It looks very similar, similar pattern of colors. What is that? It is not a spider. It's a moth. You could see this is its wing. These, this is just a pattern of colors on its wing. Mimics a spider. This is a swallowtail caterpillar. Now you might say, well, that doesn't really look like any other animal, and you'd be right. It mimics bird poop. Mm -hmm. Again, we have a wasp. This is a moth. You can see its wings, but you can see a body coloring on its body is striped like a wasp. Many species also mimic leaves, because obviously there's a lot of leaves around. This is kind of a neat picture. So here, you can see these are the antenna of this insect. This is its head grasping onto the branch. This is its body. That's part of this insect. It looks exactly like these leaves. Another insect. This is all part of the insect. This is not a leaf. Even its limbs look like leaves. Another catadid walking through the forest. This is the insect. That's its body, not a leaf. These are aquatic. This is a fish. Looks just like a strand of this algae. There it is again. Leaf. What's that? Frog. It's a toad. All right. So there's just lots of interesting examples of um, mimicry and camouflage. Another day we'll watch, this is the pocket mouse video that's really good about evolution of camouflage, but we're not going to do it right now. All right. So you can put your notes.